although she might be out of somebody's reach there is no harm in looking at her admiring her because she is as beautiful as the moon hello students welcome to nibble pop today in this class we will be continuing with our textual discussion of shakuntala by kalidas earlier in the previous video we have gone through line by line discussion on act 1 of the play today in this class i am going to help you out with act 2 and i will be focusing on the most important portions of this act and give you an idea about how the action of the play gains momentum after this act ends the title of the second act is called concealment of the telling now this creates a lot of suspense in the minds of the readers or the audience as to what is concealed and from whom the word concealment means hiding something so we will find out in this act what is being hidden and why in act 1 we have seen dushyanto arriving near kannamuni's hermitage and he sees shakuntala falls in love with her and decides to stay a little bit longer there now when he arrived there he also came with all his companions among his companions was his friend madhavya now madhavya is like a comic figure he is like a jester whom we can also call a bidushak in indian terms the function of madhavya in this book is mainly to provide a kind of a comic relief as well as help in advancement of the plot so this act begins with the speech by madhavya he is all alone standing on the stage and when a character stands on the stage and speaks his mind out and no other character is present this is technically called a soliloquy so soliloquy is a speech where a character freely expresses himself or herself because there is nobody around so it's like speaking out your mind this is usually a very popular technique with playwrights where they want the audience to know about what goes inside the mind of the characters now there is a difference between the words soliloquy and aside i'll just give you the difference here this will help you later on aside is also a speech where a person speaks to himself but unlike soliloquy in case of aside many characters or more than one characters are present on stage and a character speaks to himself so that the other characters on stage cannot hear what that person is saying but this speech is for the audience usually a side is a very short speech maybe one or two sentences or an expression or a phrase but a soliloquy is usually uh, an extended speech where the character is freely talking all right so we will come to madhavya soliloquy here madhavya is a man who enjoys the comfort of the court life he is not at all comfortable in this forest environment and he is really upset by this whole hunting expedition oh this cruel play of fate i am reduced to a state of such misery so he is calling this situation this state as a miserable one and why because i am the friend and constant companion of the king so i have to always be with the king and when the king has come for hunting i also have to accompany him he is obsessed with the chase we rattle along forest trails to the cries of here's a deer and there's a boar so whenever they are having these hunting expeditions you know people are uh, strumming through the forest and shouting at each other whenever they see any animal even in the intense heat of the noon day sun in summer when there is scarcely any shade to be seen when we are thirsty what do we drink 
Phew, the putrid water of mountain streams. Putrid means polluted, which is not clean. Tepid, bitter, with rotting leaves floating in them. So you can clearly understand the disgust that Madhavya feels to all these things which are associated with hunting. And these are the things you also associate with camping. There are people who hate that. And there are people who love the adventure. So Madhavya is not the adventurous sort. And for food, we eat at all odd hours. So there is no fixed time for eating. Meat most of the time roasted on spits, wolfing it down, flaming hot. Oh misery upon misery. The bones in my body are all out of joint. So this creates a kind of a comic relief in the audience and they uh, laugh at the discomfort which Mother Way is feeling. Galloping without a break on horseback, how can a man sleep well in this state? On top of it all, at the crack of dawn, the beaters with their pack of hounds or sons of bitches, all of them are up getting everybody up for the day's hunt. So you notice the language that Mother V is using. He is using a much more commonplace language than the language which we see being used in the first act. So while the first act gives a poetic language, while the first act is poetic in its creation of the background of love, here we see a prosaic, almost commonplace way of expressing oneself. Okay, so this is creating a contrast between the two acts. So he's very frustrated. I am rudely awakened by the ear splitting cacophony of their halus. So he is very upset with the whole hunting expedition. And to top it off, his majesty, the king, is now in love with this girl. And mother we can't understand how this whole thing is going to end. Only yesterday, speeding along, His Majesty left us all far behind and went straight into the hermitage running after a deer. We know about this incident, right? This is the incident of the first act. Then what happened? As my ill luck would have it, he chanced upon a beautiful hermit girl. Why is he calling this his ill luck? Because now that Dushanto is in love with Shakuntala, Dushanto doesn't want to go back to his capital. Therefore, Madhava also has to stay back and this situation is not at all wholesome for him. He does not enjoy being here. So this is ill luck for him. Shakuntala is the name. From that moment, sirs, the very idea of returning to the capital finds no place in his thoughts. So he is not at all interested in going back to his capital. Dawn broke this morning on his sleepless lids, thinking of her alone. Lid means, in this case, the eyelids. So we get to know that Shushanto is seriously in love with Shakuntala because he could not sleep all night. Come to a think about it. So you notice how Madhavu is feeling out of control in this situation because uh, till now he had been the companion of the king, uh, mostly sharing all his thoughts, mostly uh, trying to be with him in everything. But now, uh, now that Dushanto is in love, Dushanto is kind of cut off from everybody else in this world. That, that's something what happens when a person is in love. You know, you feel isolated from everybody else. And Madhavya is feeling all lost and forsaken. Like he cannot communicate with the king. He's not sure when he's going to be able to return to his city. So while he is going on complaining, the king comes. The king is lost in his thoughts and he's speaking to himself. Ah, deeply loved. She is not easy to win, but watching her ways, my heart is consoled. Though love has not found fulfillment yet, mutual longing is itself a pleasure. So diametrically opposite to the way in which Madhavva speaks, notice the poetic expressions that the king is using. So you can understand that this poetry is because of the love which he feels inside him. He feels that his love is not fulfilled. But this quest, this running after this woman is pleasurable in itself. And then when he starts to talk with Madhavva, Madhavva says, My friend, my hands are powerless to extend themselves in greeting. Now Madhavva is trying to complain. And he wants to uh, say that, look, I don't even have the strength to say 
hello to you in a proper way by extending my arms i salute your honor with words only may you be ever victorious so this is the usual way in which indian people in ancient times they used to greet each other by saying vijay bhava or chiranjeevi bhava so these are the usual ways of salutation okay so this is uh, what is maintained here and the king says and what has paralyzed your limbs so why are you only using words and not gesturing with your arms a fine thing to ask do you hit me in the eye and then ask why it is watering so you are responsible for paralyzing my limbs i am in this state because of your whims and now you are asking me why i have lost my strength now you notice that although dushyanto is a king madhavya has a very cordial tone or a kind of an easy flowing communication with the king because madhavya is also a friend of the king and just as you will later on find in case of shakespearean fools court jesters or fools whom we also call bidushak they had the kind of license to speak freely because they understood the kings understood that if the court jester is not allowed free speech then he cannot make fun of things therefore we find this kind of intimate cordial exchange of words between madhavya and the king and next when we see the general arriving and speaking to the king we see that the general uses lot more formal expressions and his gestures are more official now while talking to madhavya dushanto confesses that now that he has a change of heart he does not want to hunt anymore he does not want to hurt the animals which are always around shakuntala and he says i cannot bear to draw my well strung bow with its perfectly aimed arrows on these deer that dwell always beside my own dear love and bestow on her the loveliness of their eyes so he is responding to the relationship which shakuntala has with these animals and because of his response he cannot hurt these animals so you notice a change of heart here now the general arrives unlike madhavya the general is very enthusiastic about the hunting and he says that all the animals have been tracked down now it's your turn to go and kill them so they have done all the background work and he greets the king in the formal manner by bending down hail victory to our royal master the beasts of prey have been tracked down to their lairs lairs means their hiding places or their caves deep in the forest why then does my lord stay so what are you waiting for let's go let's hunt these animals down king says lord bhadrasena madhavya here has been reviling the chase so bitterly that my ardor for it is cooling off so he does not disclose to bhadrasena or the general the real reason for his reluctance to hunt he is saying that i am not interested in hunting because my energy is all kind of waning off because of madhavya the general who is of an opposite nature to madhavya he wants the king to go hunting and he says that your royal highness is a prime example of the benefits of the chase now he goes on convincing king dushanto that hunting is a very good exercise and that has been the reason for dushanto's great physique and how does he describe dushanto to us the body light manly ready for action trim in the waist fat melted away so all these things are because the king has always been hunting knowledge gained of changing responses of woodland creatures seized by fear or anger the archer's elation elation means excitement happiness so whenever an archer somebody who aims the arrow and shoots it that is an archer the archer's elation as arrows hit perfectly the moving mark here moving mark means the animals falsely indeed is the chase cursed as a vice vice means a crime something which is not good 
So it is not that a hunt is a bad thing because a hunt makes a person fit and healthy and robust. Is there another sport so excellent as this? So you see how in the delineation of character, in the presentation of character, we see the glorification of manly virtues, the glorification of physical strength as a characteristic of the hero. Therefore, we can say that this is very similar to the ancient classical drama also where the heroic figure is always the most strong man, the most energetic man and the most physically commanding man. So associating heroism with physical strength, physical dominance is a very important feature of this kind of place. But the king, he speaks out his mind here. Bhadrasena, we are in the vicinity of the hermitage. Therefore, cannot really applaud these words of yours. So, he is giving the general the command that he is not going to hunt because the hermitage is so close by and the people of the hermitage, they take care of these animals and it will hurt their sentiments. So, we also see here that along with physical virtues, along with physical glory, the king also has a sensitive side to it. So he has an emotional heroism about him also. So after the general leaves, Madhavi is alone with the king. And here we have another intimate conversation where Madhavi is curious as to how can there be a union between the king and the hermit's daughter. And he says, if she is a hermit girl beyond your reach, is there any point in seeing her? Oh, you blockhead. Why do people with upturned faces gaze upon the crescent of the new moon with unblinking eyes? Now the moon, it is also out of reach of people. But that doesn't stop people from gazing at the moon and admiring it. So he says that although she might be out of somebody's reach, there is no harm in looking at her, admiring her because she is as beautiful as the moon. But later he also says that, but I am not drawn towards forbidden things because being a king he has this sense of responsibility that whatever he does will be considered to be an example and a king cannot take decisions of his own whim and fancies like a common man therefore he has to maintain certain social obligations certain social protocols so he says that I will not be attracted to something which is forbidden to me. Shakuntala is the daughter of an Apsara. So I am socially permitted to have an alliance with her. Oh ho! So that's how it is, eh? Madhava is you know, using his characteristic comic tone. Like one whose palate, jaded by enjoying delicate candies made of the sweetest dates, hankers after a taste of the sour tamarind, you too, sir. So, here he is giving us the information that Dushanto, he is used to the beautiful women of the court because he is married and Shakuntala is like a different taste to him. So, here he is comparing Shakuntala's love as the taste of the tamarind, which is sour and when you eat sweet candies uh, one after another you end up hating sweet so much that you love that taste of tamarind in the same way Madhavya feels Shakuntala's beauty is attractive for the king and then the king says that no she is actually beautiful it's not like she is different from the people I have at home it's not that because of her difference that I love her it's because of her extreme beauty and then how does he describe Shakuntala? My friend, she needs not many words. And then he says many words. Contemplating Brahma's imaging power ineffable. The Brahma is the ultimate creator. And since anything in this world is created by Brahma, Shakuntala is also Brahma's creation and the most beautiful creation. And her beauty, she flashes on my eye, a jewel among women of another order of creation, extraordinary. 
as if the mighty creator gathering the rarest elements of beauty pictured perfection first so before creating her the creator pictured perfection which means imagined perfection and then created her then quickened it with the breath of life so this is a very glorious way to describe a woman but again i want you to notice that this description also focuses on physical beauty therefore there is hardly any space where the mental prowess the mental qualities are expressed or glorified uh, it is always the body describing the body and more interestingly he adds and i keep thinking she is a flower whose fragrance none has dared to smell springs tenderest shoot no profaning fingers have plucked fresh honey whose taste no lip has relisted so he is comparing shakuntala to a flower to the tender shoot to honey which is virgin which is not tasted by anybody which is not experienced by anybody therefore virginity or what was called purity you know equating virginity with purity is a very common convention and this is something which is emphasized here so a woman's beauty is you know it gains dimension when she is a virgin now if you have mrtya katik in your syllabus in many universities you do have you will see that vasanta sena being a courtesan does not offer her lover this virginity vasanta sena's character is much more rounded shakuntala's beauty is dependent on her virginity in the eyes of this king and this will become an a very important issue later on uh, because if somebody's virginity is an issue then uh, things like whose child she is carrying okay and whether she was married to somebody or not these things become important which we don't have in case of mrtya katika there we have a more balanced heroine here shakuntala's beauty her virginity these are her physical attributes that are glamorized here and then the king explains to madhavya how he realized that shakuntala was in love with him and there is no direct statement from shakuntala she is a very coy person shy person when i turned towards her she turned her gaze away her smile seemed the prologue to some other play with her demeanor with her attitude thus veiled by modesty notice these words veil modesty so these are the good qualities of women okay women are supposed to be modest they are supposed to be veiled because if you express your desire which we see in case of vasanta sena in mrtya katik if you express your desire you are a fallen woman okay so this is the way it was and to many people it still is love neither shone radiant nor was it concealed now this interestingly brings to my mind the concept of consent i am just digressing a little bit i think it's important to discuss it here these conventions you know trying to judge a woman's desire through hints and suggestions and not a direct statement like a woman is not supposed to tell directly whether she likes you or not that will be immodest that will be not respectable so she has to use hints and suggestions now from these things come the problem of consent because now we know this word consent is when you express your desire to be with somebody openly that is consent but through centuries of poetry what we are seeing that consent is not considered to be important direct consent straightforward consent is not even desired in women women are supposed to give hints and suggestions of what they want so this is a very patriarchal text in this way and uh, i find mrichakati a far less patriarchal because there at least women have their voices although there are 
elements of patriarchy operating there and when we will discuss that text we will be taking those things up but here they are actually glorifying silence in the name of modesty anyway now that madhavya suggests that the king should go to the hermitage pursue the matter uh, after that two hermits come in and through them we get to know about some more qualities of dushanto and how righteous he is okay how he is the friend of indra the god of thunder and through these tertiary characters we have this idea of this hero because of course when uh, you have a drama on stage you don't have a narrative voice the narrator doesn't come into play like when you read a story or an epic then the narrator speaks to you directly but on stage you have to depend on the words from other characters and it is also a very popular convention that the hero is described through the other characters who are often secondary or tertiary ones so after this we have a guard who comes and announces that karabhaka has come from the court and what message has he brought hail hail to his majesty so i'll just skip to that part the queen mother's command runs as follows so the mother of dushanto has sent a message through karabhaka sire on the fourth day after today i shall break the fast that i have undertaken the fast known as the safeguarding of the sons succession so here dushanto's mother is talking about a fast you know where she doesn't eat or drink anything for days and she will break her fast and on that day she wants her son to be present why is she keeping this fast or why is she keeping this vrat because she wants to ensure that her son gets a successor so here we get the hint that everybody at dushanto's court his family they are concerned that dushanto does not have a legitimate successor yet the king is not ready to leave the hermitage because he is pursuing something very important shakuntala so what he does he convinces madhavya that you are like a son to my mother because you are my brother so in my place you go now madhavya did not need much convincing because we already know that he was dying to go away from this place so he took the opportunity and he was very happy to go back and then the king thought something this is very important so pay close attention king to himself now this is the aside which i was talking about aside is where madhavya is there on the stage but the king is speaking to himself and only the audience can hear this fellow tends to prattle prattle means when somebody speaks a lot and blabbers out things he may blurt out something about my interest in shakuntala to the ladies in the royal apartments so the king is not get uh, you know ready to tell everybody about his love for shakuntala he has women in his capital wives who might turn against him so he does not want any undue attention before he can make sure that he can get shakuntala and this union is fruitful uh, in a sense that he will have a kid uh, through her and he tries to tell madhavya that he is staying back in the hermitage because some demons are attacking the people of the hermitage the two hermits who arrived just before this had informed them about the demons and he says i should put a different complexion on the whole matter my friend now he is talking to madhavya listen carefully i am going into the hermitage solely only out of esteem for the sages because i respect the holy men to help them because they are being troubled by the demons i have no real interest in the hermit maiden see he is not even using the name here because if he says shakuntala then maybe his expressions will change and madhavya will understand something so he is saying i don't have any interest in any girls there just to which you know for you can very well see that between our royal self and that simple girl 
a stranger to love, bred among gentle fawns as one of them. So she is brought up with the animals. She does not have any knowledge about love making. She doesn't have any knowledge about how to please men. She is completely naive. Lies a world of difference. So between my royal self and that simple girl, there is a world of difference. Do not, my friend, take in earnest what was spoken merely in jest. Earnest means seriously. Jest means as a joke. So he is trying to tell Madhavya that all his talk and description of Shakuntala was only as a jest, as a joke. And he was not serious about her. Now I wonder if this is kind of an omen. Omen, you know, a premonition, something which will happen later. It's like a dramatic irony, you can say. That as the story progresses, we see that Dushantu does forget who Shakuntala is. And their worlds are really so very different. The world of Shakuntala, the world of the greenery, the world of the unspoiled innocence is so different from the world of the court where people are suspicious of each other where women are not trusted so this difference is something which although Dushantu mentions only to convince Madhavya but it is a real fact and that will be the cause of Shakuntala's suffering as the play progresses so today I'm going to end this class here and I hope to see you all very soon with the third act which is a very important act because this is where we get to see the union of Shakuntala and Dushyanta. I hope this class was useful to you. If you have any question from this act then do tell me that in the comment section. Thank you so much for being here. Have a nice time. Bye-bye.